Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna to talk to you about the post-absorptive or fasting state. This is characterized by a decrease in blood glucose levels and how the body responds to increase blood glucose levels. Now you may be thinking, why do we focus on glucose? Why aren't we focusing on fats and proteins? And the answer to that question is because glucose is the most important energy substrate for organs such as our brain, for example. Our brain only wants carbs for energy. Now, if you think about other energy sources like proteins and fats and their derivatives like amino acids, fatty acids, glycerol, they all feed into the processes that can turn into glucose or a glucose substrate for energy. So we need to look at glucose itself. Firstly, normal glucose levels, so I'm gonna write glucose like this. Normal glucose levels sit between four to six millimoles per liter. This is where we want it to sit. If it goes too low, blood glucose levels dropping too low, we need to increase it. If it goes too high, we need to bring it back down. What we're gonna talk about today is what happens after extended periods of time of not eating what we call fasting or the post-absorptive state. This can be between meals, so between four to eight hours, or it could even be longer. For example, when we wake up in the morning after not eating for about 10 to 12 hours. What's happening in our body to maintain our blood glucose levels between four to six? All right, so first thing is this. I wake up in the morning, I'm, the, I'm a 70 kilogram male. I have my liver, for example, and in my liver we have cells called hepatocytes, which do all the metabolic processing and a whole bunch of other things. And there's the mitochondria as well, which plays a really important role of producing energy from our micronutrient substrates. We've got our pancreas, which we need to talk about here, and we've also got muscle tissue and adipose tissue as well. All of these organs and structures are playing a role in maintaining blood glucose levels. So I've just woken up. As a 70 kilogram male, I have around about 80 grams of glycogen stored in my liver. Now, firstly, glycogen is the stored form of glucose. So glucose being a simple sugar, if we don't want to use it to make energy or ATP, we click it together like Lego blocks to produce glycogen, and our liver is our primary storage site for glycogen. Our kidney also stores some glycogen that we can use, and I may talk about that in a little bit. So, I've got about 80 grams of glycogen stored in my liver, and I start to break it down. Again, I'm not eating. It's been 10 to 12 hours and I haven't eaten a thing. This glycogen, what can happen is it can break down into something called glucose 6-phosphate. And glucose 6-phosphate can reversibly turn into glucose via an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase. And that turns into glucose. Glucose can then leave the bloodstream and increase our blood glucose levels. But how does this happen? How do we take stored glycogen, break it down into glucose to be released in the bloodstream? This is where the pancreas comes into play. Because if our blood glucose levels begin to drop, the blood supply that feeds the pancreas stimulates a certain type of pancreatic cell called an alpha cell. And these alpha cells, they produce a hormone called glucagon. Now what glucagon does is it stimulates this process. Glucagon can stimulate glycogen. So if it ends in O-G-E-N, remember it means stored and inactive. That's how you remember glycogen as being the stored and active version of glucose. Glucagon, when the blood glucose levels are low, so that's its stimulus. Its stimulus is when there's a drop in blood glucose levels. Glycogen breaks down, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphatase turns it to glucose. It can then be shuttled out of the hepatocyte into the bloodstream and be delivered to the tissues of the body. But now think about this. Now that glucose released into the bloodstream, what happens to the blood glucose levels? It starts to go up a little bit. We don't want to just continually break down that stored glycogen, right? Because our blood glucose levels will go too high. So the increase in blood glucose will travel again to the pancreas and this time trigger another cell type called a beta cell and the beta cells produce something called insulin. 
And like I said, this is now triggered by an increase in blood glucose. What does insulin do in this process? Insulin again travels to the hepatocyte of the liver and it's a negative regulator. Glucagon was a positive reg regulator. Glucagon stimulated this process, insulin inhibited. So now that insulin's been released, it stops this from happening, blood glucose levels start to drop. If it drops, glucagon stimulates. Goes too high, insulin inhibits. Can you see that this is maintaining a happy, healthy balance? This whole process here that we've just spoken about for the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, ultimately, this is called glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis, which basically means glycogen, there's glycogen, lysis meaning splitting apart or breaking apart. This is the breaking part of glycogen into glucose to make energy. So this is how we first begin to increase our blood glucose levels. However, I only have 80 grams of stored glycogen. Over time, if I don't eat, I will use 8% of my stored glycogen from my liver every hour. Now the kidneys also contribute. The kidneys contribute around about 10% in this process. So don't forget the kidneys, don't discount them. Kidneys contribute 10% of glycogen storage to the utilization to produce glucose in this process. But after 10 to 12 hours of doing this and not eating, my glycogen stores are gone. So how do I maintain blood glucose levels? All right, this is where another process comes into play, which is called gluconeogenesis. Once I've used up my glycogen, the blood glucose levels start to drop again. Glucagon is stimulated. Insulin is inhibited. It's low, glucagon is high, and what glucagon can do is it can travel to distant tissues. So glucagon now can travel via the bloodstream to the muscle. Glucagon can travel via the bloodstream to the fat. And what it does is it's a positive regulator of two important processes. The first process here is proteolysis or proteolysis in muscle. What this does is it takes protein and breaks it down into amino acids. One really important amino acid in this process, which I'll talk about, is alanine. But there are other amino acids, what we call gluconeogenic amino acids, that contribute to this. So glucagon stimulates this. Now think about this. If insulin is released into the bloodstream, doesn't matter how much, even if it's a little bit, this is significantly inhibited. So we need to have low blood glucose levels, and low blood insulin levels in order for glucagon to stimulate muscle to break down protein into amino acids and to stimulate fat or lipids or triglycerides to be broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Because as we know, triglyceride, three fatty acids, one glycerol. So now what we've done is We've used up our glycogen. Insulin levels are low. Glycogen levels, uh, glucagon levels are high. Proteolysis has been stimulated. Amino acids are released like alanine. What we've got here, I didn't talk about it, is called lipolysis, I should probably say. Lipolysis, which is the splitting apart of triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol, have been released. And now what happens again? What's the whole point? Increased blood glucose levels. So what happens here? Glycerol can jump into this process. And it can reversibly turn into glucose. It can jump into this process here. Now, this process, which I haven't yet spoken about, is called glycolysis. Glycolysis is taking glucose to produce ATP. The opposite of what we're talking about here, right? Glucose, turning into ATP. Glucose goes to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate turns into pyruvate through a number of steps which I haven't mentioned. Pyruvate can jump into the mitochondria, turn into acetyl-CoA, and through the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, can produce a whole number of products. It produces NADH, 
it produces carbon dioxide. These products go, specifically the NADH, go to the electron transport chain to produce a whole bunch of ATP for energy. But we can hijack this system and make it go backwards to produce glucose to increase blood glucose levels. So glycerol can jump into the glycolytic pathway, go backwards because that's what's happening, ultimately turn into glucose 6-phosphate, turn into glucose, jump out. So glycerol from triglycerides can increase blood glucose levels. All right, that's the first point. Alanine, what can alanine do? Alanine, let's write it in red, can turn into pyruvate. Now, pyruvate is irreversible. It can't go back to glucose 6-phosphate. So how do we use alanine to produce glucose if we can't go backwards? Well, pyruvate can turn into oxaloacetate. And if pyruvate turns into oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate can leave the system, ultimately turn into glucose 6-phosphate, which is turning into glucose. Brilliant. So through this process, amino acids such as alanine, not all amino acids, but alanine specifically turn into pyruvate. Pyruvate turns into oxaloacetate, leaves the Krebs cycle, can jump back into this glyco glycolytic pathway, but go backwards, turn into glucose 6-phosphate and increase blood glucose levels. Fatty acids. Fatty acids can jump into the system and turn into acetyl-CoA. Now I want you to think about this. If this process of proteolysis or proteolysis and lipolysis have been stimulated, what will happen is these amino acids that have been utilized diminish the amount of oxaloacetate because they're turning into pyruvate, which is turning into oxaloacetate, and that's leaving the system. Now oxaloacetate is a substrate that needs to bind to acetyl-CoA to produce ATP. But what's happening here is fatty acids are turning into acetyl-CoA, uh, acetyl so acetyl-CoA levels are going up. Oxaloacetate levels are going down because they're leaving to turn into glucose. So there's a mismatch. Oxaloacetate just starts to increase, 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 increase. It can't bind to oxaloacetate. So what happens when all this acetyl-CoA increases too much? Well, they turn into ketones. And so acetyl-CoA, there's not much room here, will turn into ketones and ketones can leave the system to again be utilized as an energy substrate. How? Because it jumps back into this process and it can be used to produce ATP. Ketones. All right, something else, lactate. We can use lactate as a substrate in this process. And so lactate can come in and turn into pyruvate. And again, pyruvate oxaloacetate turn into glucose. So this process called gluconeogenesis, now there's no room to really write it up here, but let's put it down here. Gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis takes all of these non-carbohydrate based sources. So what were they? So it's amino acids, like alanine, it's fatty acids, it's glycerol, it's lactate, and takes them and utilizes them to produce glucose increase in blood glucose levels. Insulin, like I said, is a strong negative regulator of gluconeogenesis. And after 10 to 12 hours, gluconeogenesis is contributing to 50% of all the glucose that's being released into our bloodstream. Because like I said, every hour, 8% of my glycogen is being utilized until there's hardly any or none left at all. So what we're talking about here is gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis to ultimately increase blood glucose. Now the final point I need to make here is that it's not just glucagon that stimulates this. There are other hormones or chemicals that are released in the body that can contribute to increasing blood glucose levels in times of fasting. What are these hormones and chemicals? Noradrenaline. Adrenaline. Cortisol, growth hormone, 
and thyroid hormones. They are also strong, strong agonists to promote this process of gluconeogenesis. Specifically, glucagon and adrenaline. So adrenaline is the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, right? So glucagon and adrenaline, they're fast acting. They do this immediately. But cortisol, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, they're more slow acting. They take time and they can have their effects over a longer period. So this is a quick run through of what happens metabolically to your body in the post-absorptive or fasting state.